welcome you all to uh, Berkeley and to the introduction to the From Data to Knowledge workshop. Uh, we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, we have a speaker who will um, also uh, offer his uh, welcome. This is Horst Simon, many of you know as one of the co-authors of the Top 500. Uh, he was uh, twice winner of the Gordon Bell Prize. We know him locally now as the uh, Deputy Director at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Before that, he was uh, Director of uh, NURSE. So I'll um, leave it to you, and then I'll come back and give you a couple more words. Thank you, Josh, and good morning. Welcome to Berkeley. Uh, it's a perfect time, and it's the perfect workshop at the perfect time. Um, the reason why that is is because we've just seen here locally a string of very exciting events. Um, with respect to big data, of course, everybody's talking about big data, but in Berkeley, we won actually two very significant uh, uh, grants recently. So in the Electric Engineering and Computer Science Department, the AMP Lab got funded by NSF. This is an expedition for algorithms machine people, which will really look from the computer science point of view at big data. Um, at the same time, at the lab, at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, uh, BOE awarded us the SDEF Center, that's is for scientific data analysis and visualization, another uh, BOE SIDEC successor program. Um, so these two programs happened just within the last couple of months. And then um, on top of that, that's not directly related to data, we were very successful in the competition for the Simons Foundation, the Theory of Computation Institute that will be um, started here in Berkeley July 1st. And there's actually, a, as it turns out, a dedication ceremony in the next couple of weeks, May 23rd, with uh, Jim Simons and uh, arriving to officially um, send us a check, so to speak. So lots of things happening in Berkeley with data, and so I'm very pleased that Josh has been working at this for many, many years and we've been collaborating on this. And I think this is important because I think today everybody's talking about big data, but the astronomers have been dealing with big data forever. And they always had big data. It's always probably five years ahead of the time. And so I think this workshop is particularly important because in a sense, looking at streaming data, looking at real time, and looking at machine learning techniques to find actually scientific knowledge and new discovery in the data is very timely and I think is again years ahead of the rest of the public excitement about big data. So with this, I'm very pleased that all of you gathered in Berkeley and you're coming together. I want to thank Josh for putting together such a terrific program that unfortunately, of course, I won't be able to completely enjoy, but I'm at least trying to listen to a few talks here. So I wish you a very successful week. I hope you We'll learn something, we exchange information, computation, data analysis, and science are going together uh, in, very intimately now in the future. And I think this workshop is one of those efforts to really show the value of computation data analysis to make scientific progress. So good luck for the week and enjoy your conversations, discussions, and presentations. Okay, so I said that I would come back. Um, I want to uh, sort of echo what Horst um, just talked about uh, in the context of big data and ask the question of, uh, to start off, why, why are we here and where does this workshop uh, fit into sort of the larger academic and industrial ecosystems in the context of big data? Um, as uh, many of you know, the public is now unavoidably confronted with the notion that something has got to be done with this growing onslaught of data, and the government is putting some uh, not insignificant numbers of chips into the pot now um, in, a, in a way that is uh, very public, and I think that's good for, for all of us. Uh, the government, in some sense, is playing catch-up um, in a public way, although they've been funding through the National Science Foundation and DOE and such, uh, and NIH for a number of years. Um, businesses, of course, have been dealing with the big data flood for um, many years, and uh, this is this notion of how you make uh, fruitful, wonderful things happening uh, in the context of this fire hose uh, was captured, I think, well in, in this cover from the Economist a few uh, years back. Many of you, of course, have been thinking about big data issues for a number of years. Um, this is uh, just a chart from Google Trends, um, and you can see that machine learning 
at least in the public's mind, because this is what the public are searching for, uh, has been uh, sort of losing ground um, while big data has been really kicking up over the last couple of months. Um, and even before there was Google Trends, and even before there was Google, many of you in this room were actually working on the important issues um, that have enabled people to be able to deal with uh, the kinds of um, uh, problems that we have at hand. Um, so I applaud you all for that. But before we get too excited about our sort of rising stature in the public's eye, um, let's remember that other search terms like Justin Bieber uh, vastly outswamp uh, anything else that we're working on. So we're still a very minor player in, uh, in, in, in the public's view. It's clear that big data techniques uh, and analysis uh, tools have also been growing um, in the, the domain sense. So they've moved out of um, computer science, moved out of theory, and started to come into practice. Uh, this is um, a very nice uh, website uh, called uh, Bookworm that allows you to do search terms on various um, postings on the archive. And what I have is a couple of search terms from AstroPH, which is what the astrophysicists use um, to post their papers. And um, what you can see on a various, various different uh, uh, sort of trend lines here is that more or less our use of machine learning and random forest, for instance, and neural nets has kind of all been burbling along and starting to take off. At least some of the newer techniques are starting to get more and more use. But if you look at the y-axis, you'll notice that it's a very paltry amount of, of uh, use at this point. Now, obviously, not all big data problems require sort of advanced um, analytics. Sometimes we can deal with them with uh, uh, sort of better hardware um, solutions. But I think the point here also to recognize is that um, big data and big data solutions is um, really just starting to enter into the vernacular in a quite common way, um, not just in astronomy, but across the physical sciences and then, and then beyond. One of the things that I think brings us all here is not so this sort of uh, tagline of big data, but instead it's this notion of streaming data. And when we add the component of streaming, something interesting happens. Uh, there is an urgency and an immediacy to getting these uh, solutions and deriving knowledge that might not be there if you're dealing perhaps with a static data set or you have all the time in the world to derive your answer. When you think of it from an industry perspective, if you're landing on a page and you need to have some uh, idea of what to show somebody, you might need to do some major data mining and have the results pop up in 100 milliseconds. Um, so there's that kind of urgency. If somebody is off uh, using your credit card and um, there is uh, real money at stake, there's an urgency in being able to uh, obviously identify when fraud is happening. And then, of course, there's um, other issues that the government are interested in, like identifying anomalies. Um, in astronomy, we're starting to use um, random forests and other techniques to be able to make sense of an onslaught of data uh, to identify in near real time uh, exploding stars. You'll hear more about that um, in this afternoon session. And it goes on and on and on. Um, when it comes to streaming data, we need to know what we've got and what actions we need to take. And there are real sort of implications for being wrong about something, just as there are implications for being right and identifying the thing that you were actually looking for. Um, in the spirit of streaming data, what we thought would be a, a, a cute sort of intro to our notion of pulling together lots of data and trying to make some sense of that, uh, we wrote a little tool to be able to capture speech. And so everything I've been saying so far has been pushed over to uh, a Google speech to text API. We're pushing that into a Google Fusion table. And then we have um, a tag cloud that's being generated in real time. I'll see if I can demo this. this is, see how this goes. You can see what's being pulled over. I'll show you the website. This is at cloud.cftd.info. Uh, so I haven't said all that much <laughs> of interest. <laughs> I guess speech, right? Um, that's not so bad. Let's see what else. Uh, not so much new there. But what we're going to try to do is have um, this uh, more or less running uh, throughout the um, uh, throughout the conference. If people are okay with that, we're not actually saving and recording this this speech and sending that to Google. We're saving that for later. 
Um, but you'll see that this tag cloud will actually evolve with time. And uh, there should be a Twitter feed that we should be able to see here as well, which is not coming up quite, as, quite like we wanted to. Um, let's see what happens here. No, it's not there now. Um, but the important point here is that uh, just because we're grabbing lots of data and just because we're trying to do you know, NLTK on it and we're trying to actually try to make some uh, sense of it, it doesn't mean that we actually do understand what it is that we have. Just grabbing data, aggregating it, visualizing, it doesn't mean you understand and you've derived actual knowledge from that. Um, and here's an example of what we had a, a couple days ago where we're actually doing Twitter feeds um, on the top sort of tag clouds. This is kind of interesting in terms of joining streams, but it doesn't mean that we've actually learned much from it. So one of the important points of uh, streaming data is that we all have to deal with messy, heterogeneous, and incomplete um, uh, data sets. And how we make robust, even if it's only approximate statements quickly about such data, is really um, an open question, uh, both from a practical standpoint and then also from a theoretical standpoint. Um, and importantly, what are the quantifiable uh, impact uh, on the on, on the follow-up resources. That is, if we make a statement of perhaps about credit card fraud and we have to get a bunch of people involved, those people's time are actually um, something that we can quantify. And if we're wrong too often, then we've completely killed the system. So in the context of false positives and false negatives and calibrating the so-called ROC curve, this is very, very important. Um, so it's not just keeping up with the data. It's trying to make real, robust um, knowledge statements about it. Okay, so uh, let me start off our, this conference basically with the supposition of what I think uh, we, we have here. Our idea, and I think many of you have also signed up to this as well, is that domain scientists, theoreticians, um, people from industry are all going to be able to benefit from uh, exposure to a diverse set of practices in this, uh, um, in this sphere. Uh, the idea is that the techniques that are employed perhaps in one domain aren't readily available or even known to another domain. And so one of the goals, of course, is to try to transfer some of that knowledge over the course of um, this week in our, in our in interactions. The fact that all of you are here from such a diverse um, uh, set of backgrounds, I think, is reason for me to already declare this conference or workshop a success. <laughs> Um, so I guess we, we, we shouldn't go home. Um, but uh, I want to sort of end with a bit of an admonition here is that there's a particular onus on all of you um, to recognize that while there's this wide knowledge base um, of those in attendance, um, not everybody is up on all the terminology and jargon from every other domain. So in your talks, in coffee breaks, or when you're discussing posters over lunch, over drinks at night, uh, don't presuppose too much about the people that you're sitting across from. Start off um, simple as you would uh, not really knowing where somebody comes from, and then try to figure out what are the deep questions that everybody's asking, and try to see what kind of connections you can make to them. Your job is um, to be didactic, to be patient, and to speak frankly. Uh, so with that, I'll um, welcome you again to Berkeley and for the start of the conference. I'll now turn it over to Barry and James, who is um, chairing the first session. <laughs>